Am I in the right place? Uh, welcome students, faculty, and friends. We have a lecture this evening. Uh, our lecture series is sponsored by the College of the Environment and Life Sciences, by the Rhode Island chapter of the ASLA, and it is also sponsored by Bartlett Tree Experts. Uh, I want to thank Chelsea, Chelsea Gates, Phil Frias for helping with our um, refreshments. Great job, great spread, thank you. Uh, tonight, we are pleased to have Ken Smith. And we have Ken Smith not only tonight, we've had him most of the day. And it has been a treat, a special treat for our students. Ken is the, the founder and principal of Workshop Ken Smith, which has offices, uh, their main office is in New York City, and they also have an office in Irvine, California. Uh, Ken is a unique design voice because he is known uh, equally for being at home working in the worlds of art, architecture, and urbanism. He's trained in both design and the fine arts, and is often found exploring the relationship between art contemporary culture and landscape. His practice was established in 1992, which means you're 21 years in practice on your own. Um, he's known for creating landscapes, especially parks and other public spaces, as a way of improving the quality of urban life. So landscape urbanism is a theme in his, in his practice. Much of his work pushes beyond traditional landscape typologies of the plaza street and garden and includes landscapes that draw on diverse cultural traditions and influences of the contemporary urban landscape. Uh, his work covers a variety of scales and types, temporary installations, private residential gardens, public spaces, parks, and commercial projects. His work displays a unique interest in the symbolic content and expressive power of landscape as an art form. Uh, workshop specializes in the investigation of new expressions and pushing the envelope. Special projects that he's, uh, that he's involved with and has completed, uh, hasn't completed them all. East River, Esplanade, and Piers, a major project in Manhattan. The Museum of Modern Art, the Roof Garden, uh, the Elevated Acre, which is, I think, on Water Street in Manhattan, and Santa Fe Rail Yard. So he's working not only in New York and California, but in uh, Des Moines, Iowa, in uh, Santa Fe, and in India, in Mumbai. Ken Smith is a graduate of Iowa State University for our students and the Harvard Graduate School of Design. He has taught and lectured at Harvard, at City College of New York, and other universities and institutions. This is a return trip for Ken. I'm sure it's been, well, for us, it's been really special. You're in a new building now. Our building is the reason that none of you could park nearby here, because the whole street is dark, and that was our building. Um, but it's a real pleasure to have Ken here again and I'd like to wish you all well in Ken Smith. That's <clears throat> uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I, uh, I think tonight I'm going to really focus on two uh, larger projects that we've been working on, the East River Waterfront and the Croton Reservoir uh, Water Treatment Plant. And they're projects that I've been working on for about the last eight years, both of them. So uh, uh, one of the things about public uh, projects is that they, they take a great deal of time. Uh, they're very complicated. And so it, it takes a certain uh, degree of uh, patience and persistence to, uh, to uh, take on those kinds of projects. Uh, most of the work we do is, is, is urban, urban landscape. Uh, we really focus on issues of urban space and the, the conditions of uh, ur urban places. Uh, that's where the office is. Uh, we're um, uh, overlooking the um, the High Line. That's our smokestack right there, uh, which is uh, 
not used any longer. Uh, and uh, we've been in this location for about uh, three years. Uh, we're uh, roughly 12 people, uh, uh, landscape architects, and uh, we have a, a big space, an entire uh, floor, and uh, it's kind of a, uh, a messy place. It's really set up as a workshop uh, where we can have messes, we can build mock-ups and models and uh, have a kind of hand-on approach. And I would say that the, the key thing about the office is that um, we really uh, approach uh, landscape uh, from a conceptual basis. Uh, we really uh, think about landscape as a practice of ideas about uh, urbanism and about contemporary life and about landscape in, in the cities. Uh, but I think the other aspect of that is uh, that we uh, also think uh, and, and really uh, focus on issues of craft, the, the making of landscape, the building of it, how it's put together. And we're always looking for that connection between the ideas and the craft. And, and for me, when the, the craft is a kind of expression of the uh, conceptual ideas, that's a very good thing. So I think we'll, we'll start tonight's uh, presentation by uh, talking about craft. Uh, I think that we're, we're living in kind of a moment of craft, if you will, uh, culturally speaking. Certainly in the art, arts, there's a lot of, uh, I think, emphasis on craft these days. Um, I've been interested in um, uh, clothing and fashion design for a long time. And I think there are uh, some parallels that are, of, of uh, to me, of interest between uh, fashion design and landscape design. Uh, uh, if you will, um, a fashion designer is uh, creating an artifice that fits an organic body. And so it's, it's very similar, uh, the, the parallel between the, the physical body of a human and uh, the, the body of, of landscape, uh, because both move and breathe and perspire, uh, if you will. And, and there are also similar kind of um, uh, aesthetic uh, preoccupations. Uh, in fashion, uh, there's, a, there's always been this kind of divide between uh, the idea of the, um, the clothing uh, revealing the body, as, as in the Madeleine Viennet dress, uh, which uses the uh, bias cut uh, fabric to actually drape and follow the lines of the body and reveal the figure of the body. Uh, the, the other strain is some, something more like Ize Miyake, where the, the clothing actually expresses its own form and, and structure, and it's, and it's the, uh, the dialogue between that form and the body that makes it work. And I think in, in landscape, you see both those kind of treatments uh, very commonly expressed in, in landscapes, the, the debate about whether a uh, form should follow uh, nature or whether it should uh, stand apart from nature is kind of one of the recurring debates that's been uh, in our profession for, uh, I would say, uh, uh, generations and centuries. I'm, I'm also interested in uh, contemporary uh, fashion, uh, in particular the, the um, designer Martin Margiela, a Belgian designer. Uh, and he's really a conceptual designer. And, and early in his career, he did uh, this really interesting collection uh, based on uh, uh, Barbie clothes. Uh, and, uh, and you can see the Barbie doll over there. And, and of course, we all know that a Barbie doll is not anatomically correct. Uh, it, uh, a Barbie doll is really an idealized uh, idea of what the, the body is. Uh, and in, in, this, in this collection, he took the Barbie clothes and very faithfully, mechanically, took, blew them up to human scale and you can see they don't really fit the human because they are actually expressing an idealized version of human form rather than actual human form. And I think in, in landscape, um, the sort of the parallels are, uh, I, I always think about the, uh, Eng the English, classic English landscape, which is really a kind of idealized uh, form of landscape beauty. Even if you think about Central Park, I mean, Central Park is not a natural, I mean, it does perform in many ways like a natural landscape, but, but the forms are not, it's not a natural landscape. It is actually an idealized version of nature. And so this whole, this whole debate about what is uh, an, an actual human form and clothing that should fit it and what is idealized is also something that I think uh, funds or uh, drives a lot of the discussion within uh, landscape architecture. 
The other thing Marjela did, which I think was interesting, is he, um, he spent a lot of time sort of combing through history. Uh, a lot of his early collections involved going to thrift stores and, and getting clothes that had been cast off, and then taking them apart and re uh, using them. And he did collections where he take the linings out of coats and, and then uh, reuse them as, as, as outerwear, as dresses. Or he would take uh, clothes apart and refashion uh, them in, in different ways. And I think today with sort of the, the, uh, the, the movement of sustainability, we're finding a, a lot of uh, uh, movement toward reuse and, 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 and uh, adapting existing things for new uses. And so I think, again, there are sort of parallels between how a, a fashion designer thinks about clothing and how we might think about uh, the landscape. And, and certainly uh, the, the whole notion of craft, how things are put together, this, this is uh, Tom Brown's work. And of course, Tom Brown is uh, uh, adjusting the proportion of fashion uh, that we are all familiar with, but also uh, paying a real close attention to how things are put together, what the seams are, how the materials work, uh, the, the craft of clothing, and even raising questions about what is a seam, how does a seam uh, function. And I, I think in landscape, uh, simple things like how do paving materials come together? How does a how does a gutter work? How do we move water along an edge? How do how do we deal with grade changes? Those are all issues of craft that uh, uh, are important to how we think about landscapes. I think too often we tend to adopt standard forms of craft or off-the-shelf forms of craft, and we don't really think about what the craft is really doing or, or really expressing. And I think this, this seam here, which is actually also a form of uh, operation, uh, is actually really interesting because part of what a, uh, a coat is doing is it's, it's ventilating. And, and so that it's both a, a seam and a kind of a opening structure is kind of interesting in this particular piece of clothing. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about craft uh, this evening, I think. And I, and I want to give an example. I'll give two examples on craft. Uh, the, the first one is uh, this um, project I've been working on in Brooklyn. This is uh, at, in the um, uh, BAM uh, Cultural District in Brooklyn. And it's a, it's a brand new theater. It's a Shakespearean theater called the Theater for New Audience. And so this project is one of uh, Mayor Bloomberg's legacy projects. Uh, it opened a few... Uh, weeks ago, the mayor had a, a, a big uh, ribbon cutting there. And I'm not going to show the whole project, but I'm going to show a couple pieces of it. There were, there were, two, there were two early ideas that, that I uh, w was thinking about on the project. The, the first was the uh, theater curtain, uh, the idea that uh, the curtain really frames uh, the, the production of theater. And, and I, I thought that the forms of the curtain were interesting as an idea for the project, the, the kind of sinuous folds. And the other idea was, was really the social aspect of people coming together for a performance. So of course, this is a nightclub. Um, that's the El Morocco at the top, and this is Studio 54 down here. But I was interested in this kind of social seating and how we might introduce a kind of uh, social seating into the plaza where people actually hang out before a performance and after a performance. And I was particularly taken by the, the high-backed banquettes and the kind of convivial space it creates, the kind of social space it creates where people actually sit close together and, uh, and have uh, maybe private conversations. So these were some early ideas for the, the banquette for this plaza, uh, a series of uh, very generous um, uh, circular seating areas with a very high back. And, and one of the concerns uh, I had very early on about this top one was uh, with a kind of solid form, which is very beautiful and, and very nice because when you're cocooned inside, you really have a space that's yours. But in urban uh, settings, you also need to think about uh, visual connections and, and personal security and do you feel safe. And so I was uh, concerned about a solid feature. And so we did very early studies to see, is there a way we could actually open up the structure of the bench so that it was both a cocoon, it kind of enveloped you, made a personal social space, but also had a little bit of transparency to it so you could see through it and you could feel the, the space around it as well. So these were very early studies. Later on, we moved more toward a series of perforation studies. Uh, and, and ultimately, these were the, the, uh, the, the direction that we 
we moved in. And we developed both a, a, a banquette that had a back and one that was uh, backless. Now, at about this point in the project, um, you know, we're, we're developing something here that's um, it's a custom piece. It's complicated. It's, it involves three-dimensional curves. We have, a, we have a feature that's bending in, in multiple directions at the same time. So it's a complicated thing to fabricate. So we, um, during design development, we started talking to um, uh, uh, a fabrication uh, company. We started talking to Landscape Forms in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Uh, because they have a customizing division. And so all through design development, we were working with them to understand how this could be fabricated, what kind of curves we could do, what the proportions should be so that it's, it's, uh, it's comfortable. Uh, this is the um, sort of the final version of that. And you can see this is fairly washed out, but here we were starting to look at uh, how, how it would sit and the proportions of it. Uh, my client had other questions. They, their questions were more about, uh, will it be comfortable? It, is it too big or is it too small? You know, is it the right size? I had an idea where I wanted some of these banquettes to wrap around a tree. And they said, well, will you be able to get in and out of the banquette easily? And so we did a very crude mock-up. We, uh, with the, the correct um, diameter of the curve, we brought folding chairs out to Battery Park, uh, and we found an existing tree. And we, we set, set them up in the, in the scale of the proposed banquette. And this is the client uh, team. And they all came out, and they sat down and had a nice chat. And they said, yeah, this feels pretty good. We like this. It's the, it, we think it's the right size. So that kind of very simple, crude mock-up was an important part of the, the process of understanding how to make this thing. This was a study of the, um, of the perforations. And this is an early study. And, and, and in this study, you can see uh, everything is very perfectly resolved. And I'll show you in a, in a bit when we had the mock-up. Uh, there, there was something not right about this. And so we actually introduced uh, a little bit of imperfection. We actually took some holes out, and we added some holes where they shouldn't be. And in the end, the, the form that was adjusted with a certain amount of imperfection looked better. Uh, I can't explain why that is, but, but it did look better. So this was, the, this was uh, after it went out to bid. Uh, and uh, and uh, at this point, we, we've gone back and forth with shop drawings with landscape forms. And so uh, they fabricated the very first segment. This is the prototype piece, the first part of production. And so I went to Kalamazoo, Michigan, and, uh, and my job was to, uh, to, to test it out. And maybe the next one shows the noise. You, you can see that, that like this and this one are no longer perfectly symmetrical, that they, they don't perfectly resolve themselves. And there's some, some, some it, ones that the holes that are missing here. That's part of this, this kind of noise that we, we introduced, the, the imperfection into it. This is another view. And you, you can start to see optically how it, it starts to create that <coughs> sense you know, in, the, um, in the vinyl banquettes that with, with the, the buttons and the pillowing. It optically creates that sense of the traditional uh, banquette. Uh, while we were at the shop, there were there were a couple issues we were resolving. So we we had some sketch sessions with the with the uh, the fabricators and resolved some final issues, and then they moved into a full uh, scale production. So this is uh, once they're uh, installed on site. Uh, these are the uh, backless benches. I'll talk uh, in a moment about the uh, the paving, the stainless steel bands. Another view of the uh, seatless backs. And then this is the one uh, with, the, with the back uh, banquette. Now, the, the paving pattern was uh, based on the, the folds of the curtain. And um, there are, um, uh, this may be an early version. Ultimately, uh, this was done using three radiuses. It was very kind of reductive. We had a kind of. Uh, uh, 
a small and a medium and a, and a loose radius. And everything is composed of those three radiuses. And we did that in part because talking to the, the fabricators, we realized that if we, if we could have fewer custom pieces to cut, we could actually uh, save money on the project, but we could still get a, a pattern which was fluid and, and did what we wanted it to do. And, and uh, so this is, this is uh, during the um, placement of the paving. The, um, most of the bands are white cement concrete and they're, uh, they're exposed aggregate with uh, Mount Airy white crushed um, granite from North Carolina. So it's a very light colored pavement intentionally uh, to reduce the heat island uh, impact and to have a place that doesn't retain a lot of uh, heat and warmth in the summer. Uh, but there were several bands like this one uh, which are uh, 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 cast with uh, pervious concrete. And we're working with uh, Jim Urban uh, for the arbor culture in this site. And so on each side of the plaza, there's, there's a small grove of, of trees. Uh, and, and Jim has designed um, a, a planting bed underneath using soil cells. So there's a, there's a, there's a continuous uh, planting soil mass uh, that tie these three trees together. And then a, a large, generous band of pervious concrete that lies over that so that we get, um, we get uh, drainage incorporation from natural rainfall into that, that soil, subsoil, uh, to grow our trees. And so there was a great deal of effort put into understanding really the subsurface of how this entire project would work. This was one of the first big uh, installations of pervious concrete in New York City. My client was very nervous about it. And since my client was nervous, I was nervous. Um, but it wasn't the first time that we had done pervious concrete. And we worked with a um, pervious concrete um, uh, expert uh, from Pennsylvania. And uh, he had developed this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this roller. This is an aluminum roller. And uh, it spins as you pull it across. And it's spinning in that direction. And what it does is it takes aggregate and pushes it down into the matrix. Because the, uh, the pervious concrete, if you've used it, doesn't have a lot of slurry. It's very dry. And, and one of the, the problems is actually getting it compacted so the pieces really stick together. Uh, but you can see we're getting, we're getting a very uniform surface here. And, um, and it, uh, the adhesion was, was pretty good on this. So that's what the project looks uh, completed. You can see the, uh, the, the curtain folds. You can see the, the, the pervious concrete band there and there. You can see the uh, seat rings and the, and the grove of trees. Now the other project that uh, I want to look at in terms of uh, uh, craft is a, a beach residence in uh, Southern California. Uh, this is a, a client who lives on the Pacific Ocean and um, uh, they're art collectors. And um, this is a, a house that was built in the 70s. These terraces are already there. Uh, but my clients are in their um, uh, early 80s. And, um, and so they're, uh, they're starting to have some difficulty getting up and down these stairs every day. And so uh, one of the things they really needed were, uh, was a good handrail. They also were uh, bored with what they had. These were uh, all panels of turf grass, and, and they thought it wasn't very interesting. So, uh, so I've, I've proposed a, a, a series of parterre gardens and a sculptural uh, handrail that uh, uh, moves down the, the, the site. Here's a view of a, a new gate and, and that, that handrail. So this is uh, the garden half finished. This is the, um, the parterres. The parterres are made out of um, crushed glass and uh, shred rubber and uh, white uh, marble chips. And then it's planted with a very um, um, xeric, a very um, water conserving garden, which is appropriate for California. It's, it's planted with uh, sedums and succulents and uh, grasses primarily. So it's a very uh, spare and spartan garden, but it has a, enough liveliness because of the geometry and the, uh, and the materials underneath it that it's a very interesting uh, garden to look at. And of course, we were fortunate that they had this beautiful uh, uh, ancient uh, pine tree. Uh, and uh, you can see the, the detail. It's a, and it's a, it's a very nice uh, palette. So this is the uh, the railing. The, the railing is um, complicated. 
it, it's again, it's three dimensional curves. And um, I, I think uh, we, we're doing more three dimensional curves in our design work in the office now because we're starting to use uh, more advanced computer software. We're doing a lot of we're doing a lot of computer uh, modeling, design modeling using uh, Rhino uh, software. This project started out using um, uh, SketchUp, but but eventually went into uh, to Rhino because we could model these three dimensional shapes. And this railing is interesting. When at the steps, it does exactly what a railing is supposed to do. It's exactly the right height. It curves at the right place. So it, it does functionally what is necessary at the steps. But then when it it's away from the steps and it doesn't have that function, then it takes on expressive form of its own. So this is the second fitting. This is, this is really like uh, if you were buying a couture dress from uh, Dior. Uh, they, 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 they measure you and then they, they make a toile, which is a kind of a, a, a rough dress. And you, you go through several fittings to make sure it, it fits. And so this is the second fitting. The first fitting was actually quite bad. And so uh, they, they actually had to do a, a lot of reworking it. The second fitting is actually getting pretty close now. These, uh, the wood supports are just temporary supports to hold it up uh, for the fitting. And uh, this is the third fitting. And you can see here uh, we've now added the, the vertical face. So this is a, a handrail. This is the, the right diameter for handrail. There's a channel that's grooved in here for a, a light. And then there's a, a panel here which will actually uh, reflect the light and bounce it down onto the pavement. So the handrail and the hand light and the stairs is a continuous experience down the, 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 uh, these terraces. So it really uh, safely leads you from the top to the bottom. Uh, this, we're back in the shop now. This is between the third fitting and the final fitting. And this was uh, two weeks ago. I was at the site. This is the first piece that's been powder coated. Uh, it's vermilion. Uh, you can see a little bit of the uh, the channel there. The, the craft is is pretty good on that. But even though this uh, was designed uh, in using uh, you know sophisticated three dimensional software, even though we the construction documents were very detailed with all the curves and everything specified, uh, you know, very high tech. At the end of the day, it's really a handmade railing. Uh, you know, it's 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 handmade per all that sophisticated modeling we did. It's it's kind of an amazing thing. I thought that there would be sophisticated machines that would take our computer uh, models and would be able to kind of spit it out, but uh, that's not yet the case. I, I think we're probably certainly moving that way in terms of fabrication. Uh, and this was not a fancy um, uh, fabrication shop. They, these guys fabricate steel bar fences. Uh, and they were actually able to, to pull this off. Uh, here's the, the section you can see the, uh, where the light channel goes, the LED light and, and that. And you can see then the, uh, the actual uh, supports for it. Uh, the railing is being installed uh, this week. Uh, when I go back out to California a couple weeks, I'll, I'll see it uh, in its final installation. So now I, I want to go on and talk about some larger projects, the, the public works projects uh, in New York City. Uh, and I, I think uh, the, the issue with the larger projects, uh, because they're very complicated, they involve a lot of public agencies, they go on for a very long period of time, and it's very hard to maintain uh, the ideas of a project over a long period of time, because uh, staff change, the client changes, there's different people involved at different points of it. So a project may start out with a very clear set of ideas uh, and it's difficult to keep those ideas intact through the project. And it's, it's also difficult to keep the detail of the craft intact through the project and keep the, the craft and the ideas linked together. Uh, and so uh, I think that's one of the things I really uh, focus on is to try to keep the project from going sideways, to keep it moving in the, in, in the same direction. 
So this is the East River Waterfront Esplanade. You can see I've been working on it, I guess, nine years. I started in 2004, uh, working with uh, shop architects who are really good architects, Arab, our, our engineers. We're working with fabulous lighting designer, Suzanne Tillotson. And this is for the city of New York. This, again, is part of uh, uh, Bloomberg administ administration uh, legacy. And uh, it was a pet project of um, Department of City Planning Commissioner Amanda Burden. The first part of it opened in uh, 2011. Uh, Amanda, um, this, this project is almost all custom design. And Amanda uh, felt very strongly that it would be a mistake to design the whole thing and execute it all at once. So she, um, she determined that we should build a pilot project first. So we built a three block stretch of it uh, near the foot of uh, Wall Street so that we could actually test out all of our pieces to prototype them. And then if there were things that were not quite right, we could make adjustments in the design before we proceeded to build two miles of the project. Because uh, the two mile mistake is a pretty big mistake. And so I, I think that was actually a very smart thing. And in fact, we did make some uh, adjustments. Uh, and in fact, I think the other thing it did is I, I think because we knew we were doing a prototype, it allowed us to actually take some risks because we knew that if it didn't work, we could correct it. And I think a lot of times if you're approaching a, say, a two mile long project, this is a $167 million project, public agencies tend to be fairly conservative about that and they don't want to take risks. But because we were going to prototype a piece of it first, I think the city had a, a, a larger appetite for taking some risk and trying some things that they weren't quite sure about because we, we had a testing period, a beta period, if you will. And this is part of um, the Bloomberg administration's idea. The, um, uh, early in the Bloomberg administration, um, the dep deputy mayor, um, uh, Daniel Doktoroff, uh, he was the, uh, the deputy mayor of, uh, of economic development for the city. And he had done studies. Uh, and and he, he concluded that New York City needed to add a million new residents. Uh, we needed to grow the city by a million additional people in order to become, be, to, to, re, to maintain competitiveness as an international city. I'm not sure exactly how they determined that, but that's about a 15% <coughs> increase in the city population. And, 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 and that was really, uh, done in conjunction with the Department of City Planning. It was really focusing on the, the derelict waterfront and old industrial parts of the city and uh, rezoning them for much higher density, reclaiming the waterfront, building new public spaces, and also um, upgrading the transportation systems to accommodate an additional million people. And so it's, it's, uh, it's part of a, a larger economic strategy for the city. And downtown, uh, the East River waterfront that we worked on, the Brooklyn Bridge Park that Michael Van Valkenburg has been working on, and the Governor's Island project that uh, West 8 has been working on is all part of that kind of strategic reworking of the public space of Lower Manhattan, which didn't historically have a lot of, of uh, uh, public uh, open space. Now, the, for, as a design team, uh, we, were, we were challenged by um, a two-mile project that's not very wide, uh, and it ran through a, a whole diverse group of neighborhoods. It starts in the financial district, goes to the South Street Seaport, it goes through an area of public housing projects, it goes through Chinatown and the Lower East Side. So we have very different populations, very different communities with different needs. And, and a key concern was really the cross grain, how we would get people from those different neighborhoods out to the waterfront and how we would actually understand what the different neighborhoods needed in terms of uh, open space uh, and recreation. The, the, other, the other idea that we had was that um, uh, even though it was a linear project, we thought that it shouldn't be a straight line. Uh, there, there was an idea that it would be good to introduce uh, a noodle. Uh, it'd be good to kind of slow people down, make people meander. And so in this project, we've actually strategically designed it in a way that it actually forces you to uh, meander through the space. Uh, it may make you look up from your uh, iPhone occasionally to see where you're going. And that would be probably good. 
so this is the, the site. You can see that um, part of our site is underneath an elevated highway and part of our site is on a, a, a decking structure, platform structure that uh, cantilevers out over the river. Uh, and and that, that posed a real problem. This is the uh, edge of the uh, seawall. So typically where we had uh, sunlight and rain, we had no soil. And then where we had soil, we really didn't have sunlight or rainfall because we were underneath the bridge. And so that, that's a real kind of landscape conundrum. Also, there were loading conditions we had to deal with. So um, this was the f very, very early study model sketch. And um, Greg Pascarelli from Shop and I, uh, we had been looking at historic <laughs> photos of the waterfront. And in the old archival photographs, when you looked at the waterfront, there were always uh, uh, piles and stacks and lines of stuff. There was always stuff taking off of ships and was sitting there for a while. And there was always these kind of piles and lines of blocky things. And the other thing we noticed in looking at the historic maps is that the, the New York City um, a waterfront had actually ex expanded numerous times over time. They were always, you know, building a, a seawall or, or an edge and then filling out a little farther, building a new seawall or an edge. And so we had an idea that, that maybe this idea of, of these kind of successive layers of seawall or something that seemed like a seawall might be how we could solve the problems. And so these seat walls uh, became the, um, the infrastructure for allowing us to uh, create dunes of soil for the plantings. So it's really an idea that uh, it's kind of rooted in a historic idea, but it solves the basic planting uh, tectonic problem we had. And then we, we used them uh, to be the infrastructure for all of our social engineering of the social seating. So that, that one simple move solved uh, the planting and social problems uh, together. So this is a, a close-up of that. You can see that uh, we were actually able to create a fairly verdant uh, landscape, uh, a, a landscape that's quite, uh, quite varied. And you can see uh, it's not a straight line. You do have to meander uh, through it. But it's a very kind of organic and, and gentle uh, meander. You can also see the, um, the infrastructure, the social seating along the, the edges of the plantings. But it also creates and frames nice views um, out to the, uh, the harbor, uh, the Brooklyn Bridge in Brooklyn. And it's a very comfortable space. Uh, people, I think, in, innately feel comfortable here. There's uh, uh, people here all the time. And uh, it's always uh, full of uh, people uh, enjoying themselves. And uh, one of the things that we did is we built uh, bar stools into the seat railing. The, the railing is wide enough you can have a tablet or a laptop or a coffee cup. Uh, you can actually, I've seen people sit on these stools and put their feet up on, on the, uh, the counter. And um, i draw your attention to, to this, this um, periwinkle uh, uh, beam. We, um, one of the things that uh, Greg and I were very um, set on from the beginning is that we didn't want to have any light poles in the project. Uh, in, in most cities, you have uh, uh, standard lights that you have to use. Uh, in New York City, they're all stupid. You know, they're you know like you know old Cobra heads or dopey historical lights, and we didn't want to have any of that stuff in the park. And so, we working with um, Suzanne. Um, this little strip here is a is a continuous LED light strip that runs the entire length of Two Mile Project, and that uh, periwinkle uh, beam is really a big light reflector, and so that. Uh, bridge support becomes our light fixture for the entire project. It produces a very kind of soft, ambient, indirect lighting. And then we also built in lights. This is a, a lighting cove in our, our benches because I think typically in public space there are kind of two kinds of lighting that you want. One is uh, people feel comfortable if there's kind of lighting at the margins. They understand how big the space is around them. You need that kind of general lighting. Uh, but they also need something much more local, uh, like the puddle of light that occurs at your feet is very comfortable because if it feels bright enough, you, you kind of understand where you are and you can see things. 
So this is the mock-up on the bench. This is Amanda Burden, our client. She's uh, very involved in the project, and she's checking it out to make sure that it's it's comfortable and and uh, and fits good. And we're concerned about the the craft of uh, how it's put together. And in fact, the seating has been quite uh, successful. Uh, chaise lounges, traditional seats, the bar stools. But this social grouping up in the corner, we spent a lot of time on. Uh, Amanda really wanted to have social uh, situations where people could sit next to each other and chat, and also sit across from each other and chat. And so there was an exquisite amount of work spent on positioning these benches. And uh, the, the incident uh, condition that one could put their feet up on it is a really a quite amazing thing. So it's, it, it's actually a social uh, circumstance that actually allows a great deal of adaptability and, and different uh, uh, ways of using it by different people. The paving was um, uh, based on, um, on water. I guess it's kind of obvious for the waterfront. Uh, I started with um, a, a cribbed image of water from um, Google Images and then it, uh, in, it took it into Photoshop and we took it to one pixel per square inch and then that pattern became the, uh, the, the template for laying out our, our, our hex, hex block pavers. And so the, the project is, um, uses six standard, uh, a range of six standard hex block pavers, but in this pattern. And, and you can see that it creates, a, again, a pattern that is related to the waterfront it's, it's informal, it helps reinforce that meander. It's not, it's not straight, organized geometry. And um, I, I convinced the client, I, I don't know if this is true, but I told the client that um, these are jumbo hex. They're a 16-inch uh, uh, size hex. And I, I told the client that I thought that by using the jumbo hex, we would have fewer units to set. A standard hex block in the city parks department is eight inches. And so I, I said, well, it'll be less labor because we're, we're setting fewer pieces. And uh, they bought that. And I, I, I didn't check the bids. I don't know if that's actually true, but it, it made sense to me. And I also said that the, the pattern is very forgiving. You know, if, if, if you come out and you have to dig up a piece of this in the future, you know, to repair something, you, know, you can get it back more or less the same, and it's still going to look good. And, and they, they bought that also. So that's uh, the view of the lower part. This is a pavilion. Uh, so underneath the highway, we started to look at how we program those spaces. So this is a pavilion that Shop has designed. It's a, it's an out, it's a restaurant. Uh, this past summer it opened. It has a, uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a it's an outdoor beer garden. It's, it's really great, quite a fabulous place to go to. Uh, so th this is the nerdy part uh, for the, the landscape architects. Uh, this is um, looking at sort of how we did the soil. And so what I was looking at was, was really to get as much horizontal space of soil as possible because you know that it's about soil depth, certainly. But it's really about the, the, the volume of soil. And horizontal soil is better and shared root zone is better. So in, in some cases, it's, it's fairly tight. But in other areas, we could get much larger uh, spans of soil. But we did have um, some weight limitations. Arup did calculations, and they told me I could have, I think, 24 inches of soil or maybe 30. So we, we did uh, have some foam, structural foam fill in order to get the, the kind of uh, dune uh, uh, quantity that I wanted. And then we also very strategically set sea walls to align with uh, expansion joints and things so that we uh, could disguise those sort of uh, necessary elements uh, in the landscape. The planting plan was based on the same kind of pixel pattern that we used for the, the paving, so it, it's fairly straightforward. And the, uh, the soils were uh, uh, carefully thought about. The, um, uh, we, we, uh, we're looking at how um, soils work in a natural uh, landscape. There's a, there's, there's, if you go into a, a forest or even a dune landscape, there's a soil gradient that the top soils have much more organic content than the subsoils. And so we thought that that would be something that would make sense here. So we designed a subsoil that is 40% um, 
uh, solite aggregate and 15% sand. So it's 55% it's uh, really porous, free draining material. It's only 30% topsoil in the subsoil. Uh, and that's because a lot of urban landscapes suffer from soil compaction. And so we designed a soil that's very free draining. Uh, and then the topsoil then is much richer. It's 85% um, topsoil and 15% uh, composter leaf mold. So it, it's a much richer soil. And then we, in the specs, wrote a condition that when the contractor was putting these in place, they had to do a soil transition. They had to, in that, where the two came together, they had to do a certain amount of mixing so that it, it wasn't a severe line between the, the top and the sub. Uh, the, the plant palette is pretty, um, uh, I would say, um, not fancy. It's a pretty, um, um, uh, what do you say, uh, it's a, it's a no-brainer kind of uh, plant palette. It's, it's mostly natives, but not exclusively natives. Uh, things like swamp white oaks and Kentucky coffee trees and uh, multi-stem locust trees and elderberries and viburnums and, and red buds and that. But there are some... Uh, uh, somewhat ornamentalized uh, trees. I use the Hollywood juniper instead of the red cedar because in an urban space, it's, a, it's just a nicer plant. So we weren't exactly plant Nazi about it, but, uh, but, uh, but there's a lot of uh, uh, native uh, bias to it. And this is the second season, the summer, the second season. So it's a, it's a landscape that actually grew in pretty quickly and, and looked good and felt lush quickly. Uh, this is early autumn of the second season, uh, late autumn of the second season. So we've got good texture and color. Uh, see this stuff. So then uh, that's, that's the restaurant, the, the pavilion down there. Uh, and then uh, in other places in the waterfront, th this is a, a, a dog park. We're doing, further north, we're doing uh, exercise stations. Uh, ball courts, uh, bocce ball courts, uh, skateboard areas. So underneath the bridge where we couldn't grow anything, we, we started to park in the, the community needs program. So downtown where people have larger apartments and purebred dogs, they really wanted a, a dog park. And um, there was a lot of discussion about, actually there was a lot of debate about what a dog park should be. Uh, and uh, it kind of came down to a philosophical divide between those who thought that a dog park was a place for the dogs to run and blow off steam so they could go home and be tired and behave, and those that felt that a dog park really should be a, a, a more of a social space for dogs. It should operate more like a, a playground for dogs. Uh, it should be more interesting than just running. Uh, that, that, was my, that was my part of the argument. And, and so Amanda Burden asked me a couple times, she, she was querying me on um, my theory of dog parks. And since this was the very first dog park I'd ever designed, I didn't really have much of a dog park theory. But I, I reasoned that um, a dog park was actually very much like a children's playground. Uh, uh, dogs are accompanied by their caretakers. Uh, children are accompanied by their caretakers or parents. And so there, there's a similarity in, in terms of when you design a children's playground, one of the things I learned early on is that you're not just designing for the children, you're designing for the parents and the caretakers as much because if the parents aren't happy, then the children aren't happy or vice versa. You have to think about both user groups. And it's also true of the, of the, of the dog uh, park. Uh, the dogs can be perfectly happy, but if the uh, caretakers aren't, then you have a problem. So you have to think about the humans as much as the, the dogs. And uh, also, you, you, you look at how dogs use spaces, and dogs are very social animals. And, and it's, it's interesting how they, you know, they communicate. And, the, and, the, and the, uh, the, the humans also have a very interesting social life in these spaces. So there's a lot of social life in a, in a, in a dog park. Uh, so this is really a, a playground for dogs. This is a, a, a water spray. This is the same water spray that we put in the children's playgrounds in New York City. It's uh, operated by uh, the the the, uh, the humans and the dogs love it. There's seating for the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, humans. 
There's a little storage place for the hose <laughs> for washing it down. This tree has a big knot hole in it, the plywood, because the uh, the dog um, uh, uh, owners, dog the dog constituents said they wanted the Bolton board. Um, another view of it. The other thing, I, I, I had to go before the Public Design Commission. And uh, in the earlier version of this, we had a lot of color. And uh, there, there's a, a sculptor on the, the Design Commission, uh, Alice Acock, and Alice said, uh, you know, Ken, dogs are colorblind. <laughs> and I said, oh, I didn't know that. And so we went back and we basically drained most of the color out of the, out of the dog park. So I thought it'd be actually really interesting to put the humans into the dog world and, and, and make this kind of monochromatic uh, place. And we also had some fun with kind of uh, upending the uh, animal kingdom. And that's the mayor meeting with the constituents. And uh, I think the constituents gave him a good review. And that's, that's good. Uh, a couple other things we did which were interesting uh, in the waterfront. Uh, we were able to get environmental approval to build a couple uh, get downs. We were able to breach the seawall and create these tide steps. You can see the, the bottom step here is wet. Um, this is uh, Hurricane Irene uh, two years ago, and you can see it was wet then. Uh, Hurricane Sandy had five feet of water on the, on the uh, upper esplanade. So this entire area was uh, underwater. Um, and um, it survived pretty well. I, I think, um, I think the, the, uh, the seat walls sort of broke the action of the, of the waves. And the dunes were a, a shape that sort of accommodated the, the water flow. The plant community was salt tolerant enough. Uh, we actually uh, had very little plant loss. Our trees came through it fine. The paving came through fine. Uh, the, the biggest problem we had on the waterfront was really with the electrical system. So we, I, I think we had driver boxes in places that uh, in hindsight we wouldn't put them there again. We would put them in a, in a drier uh, circumstance. But uh, it, it came through pretty well. Uh, the buildings nearby didn't come through so well. There was quite a bit of uh, damage uh, uh, downtown. So this, so the other thing we did, we had two piers that we built. This is Pier 15. And um, Greg Pascarelli and I argued that uh, we should do a two-level pier. Uh, Greg wanted to do a two-level pier because he's an architect and he wanted to do a building. I wanted to do a two-level pier because I thought that an elevated landscape would be great. And we argued that two levels would provide more public space. And, uh, and, and the city bought that idea. So in the, in the base, this is, um, this is a, a museum space, a sea, uh, extension of the Seaport Museum. And uh, up front, there's another pavilion here, which is uh, an outdoor um, bar and restaurant. Uh, so this is, um, this is the pavilion. That's the bar. There's plenty of seating. This is the elevated uh, uh, upper deck. And the upper deck is really quite nice. It really affords a kind of a view and perspective of the city that you uh, don't get, uh, most people don't get. Uh, and there's a kind of nice interplay between the, 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 the two levels. Uh, it's very simple. It's a, it's a lawn uh, with seat walls uh, and, uh, and movable chairs. And um, the social life is interesting. Uh, uh, I like to point out, you know, these three guys here, uh, they're all talking to each other, right? <laughs> and this guy, I must be taking a picture of the bridge. Uh, she's on a phone. Uh, but, you know, contemporary life is something you need to think about. Um, uh, I, when I was a student, we we all read uh, Holly White's work, The Social Life of Small Urban Spaces, which I think is still uh, very relevant uh, in sort of looking at how people actually used uh, public spaces in the 60s and 70s. Uh, but I think it's, it's useful to actually re-look at how people use public space. We've been working on a project in, um, in 
in Brooklyn in Dumbo. Uh, the city is wanting to encourage uh, high-tech industries to move to Dumbo. And so one of the consultants on the project was HRNA, their economic uh, research uh, 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 analysts uh, that really work on public space. And I was sitting in a meeting, and they were, they were coming back with the survey they had done of what people are looking for in office space, uh, especially older neighborhoods. And, and they, they said, uh, people are looking for um, flexibility. People don't want office space with fixed walls. They want open plan. They want flexibility. They want, uh, they want, to, they want to be able to start small, grow their companies. So flexibility was a big issue for uh, the re rental space. People wanted... Um, Space that they liked the old buildings. They liked space that was authentic. They they liked the the, the history and the character of the space reading through. Uh, people who worked in the spaces wanted places that were uh, dog and bicycle friendly. Uh, what were some of the other findings? The, the findings were really interesting. So I'm I'm sitting in this meeting. I'm listening to this stuff. I'm going, you know. That's exactly the program for public space outdoors. It's the same program. What you're seeing in a lot of uh, new contemporary public space is a is a, 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 a an emphasis on flexibility, portable tables and chairs, spaces that can be reconfigured and used in different ways at different times of the week, different times of the year, diff different groups of people. People want spaces that uh, reflect the context and don't erase the history. They want places that you can bicycle to or take your dog to, uh, are, are kid friendly. And so I, I thought that was a really interesting finding. And so I, I think that as landscape architects, we're maybe not always so well trained in the behavioral sciences. And we don't really think enough about the social space and how people use them. But I think if you want to make uh, urban spaces that really work, you do need to think about uh, contemporary life and how people use uh, contemporary places. Uh, the lawn is fabulous. People love this kind of. Uh, simple uh, use of space. So the other pier we're doing is Pier 35. This one is more landscape oriented, so I have a little stronger hand on this one. It's a series of, um, of folded uh, uh, plates that form the horizontal plane. There's a, hor there's a folded uh, vertical screen, and uh, this is a, a little uh, ecological demonstration area. So that's the, um, this is the eco park. It's a muscle habitat that I'll show you. Uh, these are the, these folded uh, plains, these uh, dunes and lawns with scattered trees. At the end, there's a kind of an elevated platform. And the, uh, the folded uh, vine screen lifts up and forms a kind of a big shade canopy. And from that, we're hanging uh, a whole um, a row of um, porch swings. Um, Mostly because, in my opinion, there are not enough porch swings in public space. Uh, I, I went to this park in India, in, um, in uh, Chandigarh, uh, 15 years ago, uh, that this artist, uh, Nick Chand, had designed. And he had, uh, he had put swings in the park. And I remember going to this park, and there were all these women in saris and kids, and everybody's swinging. The adults are swinging. It was like a playground, but for adults. And I just thought that was fabulous. And so this is really kind of a front porch for the city. And so people should be able to go out and sit in a porch swing and enjoy the, the river. That's the, uh, the view of what uh, we think it will look like. Those are those uh, porch swings. This is the uh, eco habitat, the vine screen. Uh, another view of that. The, uh, the vine screen is hiding a sanitation building behind it. It's our plant palette, uh, planting plan for the vine screen and what we think it might look like with the different species uh, competing with each other. And then the eco park is uh, this little area. This part of the pier had uh, collapsed. And so rather than rebuild it, um, uh, the the city's decision was that we should do an ecological demonstration. They got a, uh, a, a, an ecological grant to, to do that. And the, the program was to create a habitat for mussels because the water quality in the river is much better now and the mussels and the oysters are starting to come back. So this entire landscape uh, functions from uh, low tide to high tide. So twice a day it fills up and twice a day it empties out. And this was the... Uh, the first study of, of, of the rockeries that we would put in for the mussels. 
And then this is um, at the, the precasters uh, shop near um, Albany, New York. Uh, we worked with an ecologist who uh, helped us get the right texture for the muscles and to uh, understand the, the size of crevices that we needed to create the right kind of habitat. This is also when I started getting very excited because I, I realized what a big feature this was. Uh, one of the things about an infrastructure project is you actually get to do kind of big things. Uh, so this is the placement of the rockeries. Uh, my staff came up and supervised uh, the placement of every single rock so we had the right spacing and they and they looked good. Uh, that's that's the beginning. You can see these are the, the additional pieces of precast concrete that have to be placed yet, so you get a sense of the scale of it. Uh, it came down by barge uh, down the Hudson River and around the bottom and up the east side. We had the largest crane on the east coast. This particular block, this is one of the bigger blocks, this is a 58 ton piece of precast concrete. And this is what it looks like at, at low tide. Uh, you can see it's starting to get uh, a fair amount of uh, green growth on it. Uh, this is during tide change. You can actually see the water coming in and going out, which is pretty fabulous. And this is high tide. And then these are the bridge supports. There's a, a pedestrian footbridge that will go over this so that everyone going to this pier will cross the bridge and look down into the uh, mussel habitat. So the, the last project I'll show is the, the Croton Reservoir Water Treatment Plant Golf Driving Range. That's the official title. Uh, it's in the, in the Bronx. The, the reservoir is up in the, uh, the Catskills. Uh, New York City has fabulous drinking water. It's why the city grew so uh, quickly in the, in the 19th century uh, water and power. Uh, fresh water was uh, good. And, and the water quality is still very good. <coughs> but in order to comply with uh, federal uh, uh, Clean Water Drinking Act standards, the city is required to build up a water treatment plant. And so the city did a study of different locations to build a treatment plant. And of course, when you do something like that, uh, nobody wants it in their neighborhood. And the city doesn't want to buy new land because that's expensive. So these things tend to end up in a public park. So this is built in uh, Van Cortlandt Park. And it's built on the site of a uh, municipal golf course. And it's being built on top of the former driving range. So the neighbors wanted, um, they wanted their park back at the end of the day, so the requirement was that we had to return it more or less to original grade and it had to function as a golf driving range. So that's our, our site. There's the, the golf course. Uh, you can see it's a pretty big, um, it's a pretty big hole in the ground. These are apartment buildings. That's a subway. Uh, that's a view, this is a couple years ago, this is before they finished. So this plant is built 90 feet into the ground. Uh, they dug out 90 feet of solid bedrock. Uh, and then uh, it's a nine acre uh, building underground. And so we have a nine acre roof uh, to, to, uh, to, to work with. Uh, nine acres of impervious roof. So that's a lot of stormwater runoff. Uh, the site is located uh, adjacent to riparian uh, uh, woodlots, which are ecologically significant, and also some significant uh, tree rows and wet meadows. So we had to be very careful about the, the ecological resources here. And also, uh, the other thing is that um, a water treatment plant is really a high security facility. It's the drinking water for the whole city. And um, even though it's this kind of big rectangular shape, one of the uh, concerns was to uh, not make it too visible and there were a whole series of security requirements in terms of uh, vehicular and pedestrian interdiction. So the, the, the Part T was really to uh, superimpose a, a circular form to really disguise the square box so you really wouldn't know where it is. And then to use a series of walls uh, and moats to create a security barrier around it and then to use the moats as the storm water system for the entire plant. So we're taking 
uh, the stormwater runoff from the nine acre roof. We're capturing it. Uh, uh, because it's a golf driving range, uh, there's a fair amount of uh, fertilizers that's used on the turf, so there's a fair amount of nitrogen, nitrates in the water. So the, 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 uh, the nitrate laden water then goes through a series of uh, water treatment cells, phytoremediation to clean up the water, uh, quality aeration, and then it ends up in a, in a reservoir at the bottom, and then that's our um, water source for irrigation for the uh, golf driving range. So this is the site. Uh, that's the, the natural water flow across the roof. It's a 2% slope on the roof. Uh, it's pumped up to the beginning of the water cells. It moves through the water cells and then eventually ends up in, in a, a, a reservoir at the bottom. Uh, the the, the T-box is at this size. These are the, uh, the targets. And then these are the uh, water treatment cells in the, uh, in the moat. And, um, and it involves the construction of about two miles of walls. And so for a landscape architect, uh, that's a pretty big project. Two miles of walls are, are a pretty, pretty amazing thing. So the, um, the idea, and this is working very closely with the architects Grimshaw. Grimshaw are, are very uh, good infrastructure architects. They really understand the scale of these things. And so uh, this is both sort of cost and aesthetic, but uh, we, we developed a, um, a palette of sort of rough hewn walls, gabion walls, that occur in the outer uh, precincts of the site that don't have a lot of public uh, access or visibility. Uh, stone clad walls where we have a more public uh, 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 visibility or public interface. And then uh, core tin steel walls uh, for, for the buildings. Uh, and this, I'm sorry, this is all washed out, but the, the problem I was faced on the walls is that uh, the site is not flat. We had uh, different requirements for heights for security. So none of our ground planes were level and none, none of the top of our walls were level, and rarely were the top of the wall and the bottom of the wall parallel. So they're all kind of moving with their own logics. And I said, sort of immediately at the beginning of the project, I said, well, we can't have any jaggies. We can't have any steps in the top of the wall. We have to figure out a way to do these walls so that they're all very smooth and continuous moving through the landscape. So we designed the walls from top down, designed all the stone coursing from the top down. So this is the mock-up, that, that the first mock-up to, to test it out. And the idea was really, it's like a sedimentary uh, geology that is, is uplifting and rising out of, out, of, out of the ground in a kind of very sinuous way. It's complicated because you, you, of course, have to build the wall from the bottom. And so the bottom of the wall has to be set absolutely correctly so that w at the end of the day, the top is, is perfect. And you see this is a, a stone veneer wall. It's made with um, uh, alcove bluestone from upstate New York, which is a beautiful uh, bluestone with a lot of this kind of uh, rust color to it. So this is the, um, the uh, actual um, uh, mock-up for uh, approval. So this is uh, the first segment of wall that was built. This is uh, about a year ago now. And so uh, they built this piece and we came out and there were all sorts of problems. They, you know, there's some things like that that weren't right, and they, you know, they just, we, so we, 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 we basically critiqued the wall and wrote up the field report, and then they, they corrected that, and we came out again, and there were a couple more things, and so the third time we came out, they basically had gotten the methodology down, and, and then we approved this section of the wall as the approved mock-up, so all the rest of the stone walls in the site have to meet this quality standard, but you can get a sense of the scale of the wall. These are pretty big walls. This is the end of the wall. The walls are three feet thick, not because structurally they needed to be three feet thick, but walls this big needed to have a certain amount of uh, girth to them to feel proportionally uh, correct. And you can see the, the kind of care we're taking on the, the resolution of the corners and the, and the capstones and things. There is, you know, a great deal of, of thought and, and work went into uh, how this, this wall was put together. 
The other walls we're doing, uh, about, about a third of the walls are stone, about two thirds are gabion, because the gabions are a lot cheaper. Uh, and we're using uh, off the shelf uh, gabion baskets, industrial gabion baskets. Uh, this is uh, the, the footing for one of the walls, so you can see that the, uh, the footing is, in this case, it's 12 feet wide. These are three foot by three foot uh, baskets. <coughs> so it's, it's a fairly uh, muscular uh, 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 project. It's a, it's a fairly big project. And you can see how, how deep they are into the ground at this point. This is the, the building of the part of the wall that's exposed. And you can see that it has a, a pretty, pretty crisp align to it. It's pretty, pretty clean. Uh, the uh, stones, the, the face stones are all hand placed. So on, even on a project of this scale using an industrial uh, product, we're actually uh, using a, f a, a great deal of hand labor and care to make sure that the thing is, is beautifully resolved. And it, it produces something very interesting. I mean, the, the, the baskets themselves are not perfect. I mean, they're, this is about as perfect as you can get them. But sort of the interplay of the basket and the, and the careful placement of the stone is actually something that is actually quite, uh, quite lovely. And then you get a sense of kind of the, the scale of, of, of the walls. Uh, and they too have the kind of sloping uh, tops and, and bottoms. And this is the point where um, uh, the gabions and then the stone wall come together. And so uh, when, when the, the veneer stone comes, you can see the, the shelf that's been set in place uh, for the stone to be stacked up. Uh, there will be perfect planar conduction between the, uh, the gabions and the, and the stone. Uh, the, the wetland cells, cells one through four are mostly very shallow uh, cells. They're about uh, dropping out sediments and about uh, uh, plant vegetated swales to actually uh, to consume the, the, the nitrogens. Cell five and seven are really about aeration. Cell six is about public uh, interpretation and demonstration and public visibility. Uh, this shows those, those upper cells and, and uh, the the shallow emergent and different uh, wet meadow conditions, and then the kind of kind of shallow condition in these small islands that the, the water moves through in those uh, upper cells. Uh, this is cell five. This is a tighter s situation, and these cells have a lot of rockery in the bottom, and this is about aerating the water and, and sort of in increasing the uh, oxygen content. And then at the bottom we have uh, the reservoir, uh, which then is the is the clean water that we we draw upon for irrigation. And so this was an early view of, of being in the Gulf driving range, driving across the uh, the security moat and and the uh, and the vegetation regime uh, to the uh, the Gulf uh, driving range. Uh, this is a, a study model of the topography. Um, these things are the um, air uh, intakes and exhaust for the plant. And they stick up in the air about 12 feet. So uh, what we're doing here is creating a very shallow bowl. We're bringing the soil up at the edges to the tops of these so they don't stick out of the ground. You can see the slopes there. So it's a very shallow bowl, which I think perspectively will create a very interesting space. And then uh, we're creating earthworks at each of the targets to make the, the driving range uh, uh, targets uh, visible for the, for the golfers. That's the, uh, the plan. This is, uh, th there must be some golfers here. Yep. Okay. Uh, in, um, in golf design, I don't play golf, but I've learned a little bit. In golf design, our, our golf consultant calls this the uh, Christmas tree diagram for golf driving range. So the, uh, the farthest target is the top of the tree. And then as you move out, they, they get farther apart, the closer ones. And so that's the, um, that's the diagram for the, 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 uh, the driving targets. We have uh, several different kinds of, of, of turf and different uh, mowing regimes. So there's a little bit of vari variation out there. So this is the roof, the nine acre roof. These are those. Uh, air take plenums, there's other sorts of infrastructure and stuff all over the place. And now I'll just walk you through typical section. That's the plenum. 
And so the first thing that happens is there's a drainage mat to protect the uh, roof membrane. There's a, 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 a leader system of, of stone uh, drain lines that, that collect the water and, and, and drain it away. Uh, these are the drain rock and wire cage. Now we're going to zoom in a little bit. There's a, a insulation that goes on that's channelized for water movement. And then there's a whole series of structural geofoam layers that are stacked up to create the uh, topography uh, with maximum three to one because in a golf course design, that's the maximum that a lawnmower can conventionally uh, mow on. Uh, filter fabric, uh, irrigation system, and then the, uh, the soil. Uh, on this roof, this nine acre roof, uh, our structural engineers uh, calculated that we had enough weight load for 10 inches of soil. So it's not a lot of soil. And that's why all of the, the geofoam, because uh, otherwise we would have had a perfectly level terrain and we wanted to do something much more sculptural. And then on top of that are, are the planting systems. So this is, uh, this is about a month ago. This is in October. So you can see the, um, the stacking of the, uh, the geofoam and the, they're starting to place the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the soil. Uh, that gives you a sense of scale of the geofoam, up, the soil pump or the soil uh, auger. And um, you can't really put a stockpile of soil on the roof because it weighs too much. And you can't really drive out there with dump truck loads of soil because that weighs too much. And so they built a, a special trackway that spreads the load and they bring an inloader in with a small dump load and it dumps into uh, this bin here and the soil is uh, augered up and then the the workers grab onto this this chute and they actually go back and forth and they place the soil on the on the roof and so uh, they've been doing that for quite some time but you can see they're starting to get uh, close this edge here this is one of those targets uh, for the for the driving range another uh, view you can see here these are the plenums. You can start to see a little bit of that shallow bowl that we're creating uh, at the scale of this, this landscape. And it's subtle, but you can also start to see some of the, the knobs for the, uh, the targets there. And then over here, they haven't done the foam yet, but this also will start to sweep up. That's the, uh, you can see the soil coming out of the auger in that shot. Uh, and now I'll show you a little bit of the, the buildings. Uh, the buildings are made out of uh, stone and core tin steel. Uh, this is a, a full-scale mock-up in the factory of the, uh, the core tin steel panels. And then this is the uh, installation on site. Uh, you get a sense it's pretty thick material. And that's the, uh, the roof when it's finished. That's the, uh, the entrance to the facility with uh, stonework and, uh, and uh, green roof. And uh, that's really what I wanted to show tonight. Uh, you can, some of the projects are on the Bayhaunt site, and I'd be glad to take any questions you might have. So how long has that last project taken? Uh, it's how long did the design phase take, I guess? Well, the design on, uh, ongoing. We've been, um, I think it's been about eight years. I, I, <clears throat> I don't remember exactly when we started. Uh, but we, we did the, um, the industrial plant first, the arrivals and receiving building and the parking lots for the DEP facility. That was done first. Uh, the building you saw is part of that facility. So that's nearly complete now. <laughs> and uh, they'll be doing plantings in that area this coming spring. Uh, the, the driving range roof was part of that package, so that will be planted this coming spring. The package uh, for the clubhouse uh, in the public facility we designed uh, and completed in, uh, I guess we must have completed that in 2009, and then the project was running over budget, and so last year we went through a complete value engineering exercise and we've spent the last uh, six months redesigning 
that part of the project and we're just finishing the construction documents now for that facility and that will start construction next year so the, the whole project will probably be finished in you know 2015 or 2016 uh, it's a billion it's over uh, the entire project is over a billion dollars and the uh, the public facilities the landscape and the architecture is about a hundred million uh, budget so but you know it's big and it's complicated yes how does such a small office like yours do such large projects? I don't know it's a miracle <laughs> <laughs> um, well we really do focus on them we don't do everything I mean we we, we have uh, we have uh, a dozen projects at any given time and they're all in different sync and a project like this is not something where it comes in and you go and pump it out quickly I mean it gets stretched out over over time so I um, mean we managed to do it uh, I, I, I don't know how I I guess EDA would probably or ACOM would probably say we, we can't do it but somehow we do so uh, and part of it is that we work closely with the architects uh, and the architects have a little more firepower than we have and so that that helps and um, and also these projects are in our backyard they're in New York City so that helps we know the we know the regulatory circumstance we know the agencies and so that that helps but uh, you know 12 12 people we were 24 people in 2008 12 12 to 24 people can actually <coughs> produce a lot of work I know you collaborate with a lot of different people, but on your own staff, do you have an engineer? Or like no, we're all landscape architects. All landscape yeah, and so I work on all projects, and typically uh, there's a project manager on the project, and they stay with the project all the way through, and they do all the day-to-day, -day, week to week slogging through, you know, all the meetings with the clients and the agencies and all that stuff. I go to the, you know, particular ones and that and then and then we have uh, uh, the the production the younger folks the production people then they float around on on different projects and uh, like the week before Thanksgiving was pure hell in the office because holidays agencies always set the deadlines are always just before a holiday and so we had I think we had three simultaneous big deadlines before Thanksgiving uh, that that uh, the the, the clubhouse Construction documents were due. Uh, the the final construction documents for Des Moines were due, and there was some other thing that was due. And so it was really uh, that's probably when we could have used fifty people. But, <laughs> but yes, the scale of some of these projects are almost like inconceivable. How do you? What's that like mentally, shifting from someone's backyard to a nine square acre driving range? Like, what is that? Well, that's ideal, right? I mean, can you think how boring it would be if you just did the same thing all the time? I mean, I, we've always had a diversity of stuff in the office. I mean, by, by design, we've always taken everything. But, uh, I mean, I've, it's been a long time before we actually ever got offered to do big projects. I mean, it's been a gradual building of the office, and I think at some point we have done enough work that you know we're capable of doing the larger projects now but the thing I learned about larger projects is that a larger project has a lot of smaller parts to it and so I mean you deal with the smaller parts you have to make sure they all hold together but uh, a, a big project is really a bunch of small projects yeah. any other questions uh, well you can ask questions Good. out in the lobby. thank you I'd like to say thank you for this lecture.